Hi, everyone, and, and thank you so much for joining us today for our virtual Los Altos Community Coffee. I'm Assemblymember Mark Berman, and I represent the 24th District in the California State Assembly, which includes Southern San Mateo County and Northern Santa Clara County, all the way up to the coast, uh, Half Moon Bay through Pescadero down to the Santa Cruz County border. I know we're all tired of these Zoom events, uh, but with the rise of the Delta variant, we decided it would be safer uh, and figured folks would be most comfortable if we stick with virtual events for a bit longer, uh, but hopefully we'll be back to doing these in person soon, which is, is definitely my preference. The legislative session ended about three weeks ago, and I'm excited to spend more time in the district over the next few months. This year, I introduced the most ambitious package of bills of my five years in the assembly, and I'm incredibly proud to report that we've been very successful at either getting these bills approved by the legislature or getting the ideas into this year's state budget. Due to COVID-related restrictions on our work, legislators were only allowed to try to pass 12 bills this year. 10 of my 12 bills passed through the legislature and made it to the governor, while the other two bills were included in the state budget, which means the bills were no longer necessary. One bill that we got added to the budget is to create a basic needs center and hire a basic needs coordinator on every community college campus in California. This will provide a single point of contact for students to more easily access, gain awareness, and be connected to basic needs services and resources around housing, food insecurity, and mental health. I was also successful at getting $30 million in ongoing funding to support this effort. The other effort we got into the budget is to establish a statewide office of school-based health, which will help ensure greater access to healthcare services at K through 12 schools across California and draw down federal funding that's available to provide on-campus on health services, which we know are so critical to support student well-being. My bill that has perhaps garnered, garnered the most attention would end the sale of small gas-powered engines, such as leaf blowers and lawnmowers in California. A lot of people don't realize this, and, and I didn't until I introduced the bill, but this year, in 2021, small gas-powered engines are set to overtake cars as the leading pollution emitter in the state. My bill, AB 1346, would end the sale of this highly polluting equipment and transition California to cleaner and quieter alternatives. And, and very importantly, I also secured $30 million in the budget to help small businesses and small landscaping companies transition to zero emission alternatives. Last year, based on one of my bills in 2020, elections officials mailed a ballot to every active registered voter in California and every county adopted a ballot tracking system so that voters could be assured that their ballot was properly processed and counted. This emergency effort was wildly successful, and California had the highest voter turnout since Harry Truman was president. This year, I wrote the law, <laughs> we're having uh, uh, video difficulties, and I've got a little light that keeps on going off, so apologize to everybody for that. Uh, this year, I wrote the law to make these vote-by-mail changes permanent, and Governor Newsom signed that bill on Monday. At a time when other states across the country are making it harder for people to vote, I'm proud that California is proving that we can have safe, secure, fair, and accessible elections. This next bill is one that I think we can all relate to. Uh, have you ever signed up for a service or membership online? And after hardly using the product, you've gone to cancel it, only to find that even though it was so easy to sign up for the service, it's practically impossible to cancel it online or even over the phone. I know that's happened to me and my staff a lot. This year, I introduced AB 390, which will ensure that consumers who sign up online can cancel their subscriptions online and that they can do so without delay or having to jump through a dozen hoops. These community coffees are a great source of potential bill ideas. Two years ago, at one of my last in-person community coffees, a Stanford University professor and doctor approached me about people going in for treatment for substance abuse, but ending up getting addicted to tobacco while they were in treatment. My bill, AB 541, addresses this problem by requiring treatment facilities to assess patients for tobacco use and offer or refer them to treatment to quit tobacco. This bill was signed into law by the governor in August. Finally, as some of you may know, since the day I was sworn in five years ago, I've been working to improve our higher education system so that it serves the needs of students and their families. 
After four years of informational hearings and hundreds of conversations with students and stakeholders about the challenges students face, we decided to laser focus on the unnecessarily complex transfer process from community colleges to four-year institutions. I introduced a very wonky and ambitious bill, the Student Transfer Achievement Reform Act of 2021, to reimagine the transfer process from the student perspective and remove barriers to transfer, such as expanding the use of the wildly successful but underutilized associate degree for transfer and establishing a single general education pathway, uh, general education transfer pathway that meets transfer admission to CSU and UC. Going from two general education pathways to one makes it easier for students to apply to both CSU and UC and keeps their options open if students don't yet know where they want to transfer. As soon as the legislation, as soon as the legislative session ended, I pivoted to addressing another issue that I know a lot of constituents feel strongly about, reforming California's undemocratic recall process. As the chair of the Assembly Elections Committee, I'm joining with my Senate counterpart, Steve Glazer from the East Bay, to convene a series of joint legislative hearings in the coming months to begin a statewide discussion regarding reforms to California's recall laws. Our goal is to produce a proposal that will be taken up in the legislature next year. I hope that you'll follow these conversations because any substantive change to our recall process will require a change to the state constitution and any constitutional amendments require voter approval. Uh, so this is gonna, if, if we're successful at getting something on the ballot, this is something that you'll see possibly as early as uh, the general election in 2022. So as all of you can tell, uh, I'm very passionate about what we've gotten accomplished this year, but I, I wanna pass the mic to someone we all owe a debt of gratitude to uh, for her hard work and dedication to Los Altos. And that's Mayor Nisa Flagger to make some opening remarks before we jump into all of your questions. And just uh, some housekeeping, uh, we'll start by answering the pre-submitted questions that we've received, uh, which we've consolidated, because there are a lot of questions of, of variations on, on same themes. Uh, and then we'll try to get through those that were submitted via the Q&A function. So if you have questions that you wanna ask live, make sure to use the Q&A function. That's where we're trying to keep track of all the questions uh, that come in today. And, and we're gonna get through as many questions as we can. We're also recording uh, the event and we're gonna make it, I know some people uh, reached in and said they, they uh, you know, the students who couldn't watch it because it's in the middle of school. So we'll make this available. We're still figuring out the details of that, whether it'll be on the website or on YouTube or, or available if you reach out and want us to, to um, uh, email it, you a link. So we'll, we'll get that figured out, um, but make sure that everybody has the ability to hear today's conversation. So again, thank you so much, uh, Mayor Flagger, for, for joining me today. Thank you, Assembly Member Berman, and thank you so much for being here and making yourself available to the Los Altos community. I am so excited you're doing this. I know many residents appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate the fact that we're recording this so that the questions asked today and the answers given will be available to our residents. So thank you. And thanks for everything that you've done for the community. Um, as you've described, you've been very busy. And I know a lot of those bills that you push through will benefit um, the Los Altos community. So as Assembly Member Berman said, Nisa Flagger, and I am the mayor of Los Altos, and I'm happy to see a lot of names on the attendee list that I recognize. Um, you know, we have had, like many other jurisdictions, a busy year. You know, COVID is still very much with us. Um, a few friends have referred to me as the COVID Zoom mayor, only because as mayor, I've only conducted meetings um, over Zoom. And so, you know, we've had our challenges this past year, but we've also had a lot of success. And so I do want to highlight a couple um, of these things that we were able to accomplish as a community, and it's only September. Um, of course, we have our community center grand opening on Saturday, October 2nd at 2 p.m. Um, this is a project, as many of you know, that's been around for decades, and we're finally able to bring it across the finish line, and the opening is on Saturday. Um, if you're not able to attend in person, we're hosting a ceremony outdoors. If you're not able to attend in person, then we will also 
be live streaming the event on the city's YouTube channel. And we'll also record the ceremony and have that recording available on the city's website. I also wanted to touch on a couple of things we have done you know, with and for the community this past year, including providing grant funding for our business community. As we all know, they were hard hit by COVID. And so one of the things the council did early on was to provide this grant funding. We also allowed the parklet program downtown, which I know many residents appreciate and enjoy. Um, we also made donations to CHAC, um, which is the mental health organization that supports our schools um, and or, or kids um, here in Los Altos, and also the community services agency, CSA. That really provides a lot of support to our residents and community, and we're so fortunate to have CSA supporting Los Altos residents. And I could go on, um, but I, I wanted to flag those as things we have accomplished as a community this past year. As Assemblymember Berman mentioned, I will be, he, we have brought him to Los Altos virtually. And so I will be playing the moderator role initially where I will go through the pre-submitted questions. Um, some are for me and some are for Assemblymember Berman and we'll go back and forth and answer them. Um, and then we'll switch to a different format. And so again, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And so Assemblymember Berman, are you ready for the questions? Let's do it. Okay. Um, so first, I'm, I'm actually going to give myself a question to start only because let, it's top of the list. Let me, get, let me, I'll give you that question. How about that? All right. Yeah. So <laughs> congratulations, uh, Nisa, to, to Mayor Flagger, for you, to you and your colleagues for pushing the community center project over the finish line uh, with the legal budget, uh, I guess, has, has grown um, possibly from $700,000 to $3 million plus, according to this question that we received. Um, there's a concern that a lot of the spending is going to go to lawyers and less to, to community services in the community center. What can be done to minimize uh, legal risk and, and uh, make sure that as much of the money is spent on the community center and not on lawyers? No, thanks for that question. Um, and I know that question, um, even if only one person submitted it, I know it's a question that's top of mind for many residents. Um, the town crier had an article on this a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they're correct. So our legal budget, and again, this is the amount we're budgeting, um, has gone up and, and, and the amount is the right estimate. And it's unfortunate, and this is something as a council member, and I know my colleagues on council, you know, we'd prefer not to happen. But these are lawsuits that have been brought against the city. So these are not lawsuits that the city has initiated. These are lawsuits that have been brought against the city and we have to defend them. Right? We represent the taxpayers and the residents of Los Altos, and we have to defend them. And so that is what you're seeing with this increased budget. But having said that, I will say it is our top priority as a council to see how we can reduce the legal budget. And, and sometimes a lot of this is out of our hands, as you know. But this is not a place we want to be, and this is not something that we want to continue doing. And so to the extent we can make decisions or work with our attorneys to deploy strategies that avoid us from incurring these legal costs, that's where our focus is. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just to you know, add, we agree with you. We would love to, spe to be spending these dollars on other projects for our community, whether it's the community center, whether it's the roads, whether it's our EOC, whether it's helping residents, that's where the council would ideally prefer to be spending this money. But unfortunately, these lawsuits have been brought against the city and we have to defend them. Makes sense. And, and it's one of the more frustrating things I know from my time on the Palo Alto City Council, but, but like you said, it's important for cities to defend themselves and, and the work that you're doing. Um, let me ask another quick question to you, Mayor. Are backyard fires and pits allowed in Los Altos during drought or fire season? Great question. Thank you. So I had I, staff look this up because I wanted to make sure I was giving the right information. So per BACMED, which is the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, during the spare the air alert days, um, 
we are not allowed, we are prohibited from using wood burning devices, both indoors and outdoors. On these days, residents are also advised to limit their time outdoors, especially those sensitive to unhealthy air. And this would apply to the wood burning fire pits that I think the resident is referring to. And so during the spare the air days, the answer is yes. During the drought season, there's currently no prohibition on use of fire pits. Um, but for all the residents listening, I would encourage you, if possible, to minimize or not use your backyard fire pits during this period. Um, it's a valid point raised by the resident. Um, I, I feel like during the season, Assemblymember Berman, every day is spare the air day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's not an official back mm -hmm. meds for the air day, you know, to really be proactive and address these concerns, I think we can all take the initiative and do some of the things that we're required to do on spare the air days. I think it's a great point. Better to be safe, uh, especially over the next, I know I was talking with um, some folks about how this next month uh, might be, you know, one of the most dangerous times of the year. So uh, if everyone can be as safe and, and prudent as possible, uh, that's that's the best guidance to follow. Uh, Mayor, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let you pick the next one. Thank you. I was beginning to think this was my town hall. Not I, at all. I want to ask you questions and I know the residents really want to hear from you. Sure. So let's start with, um, you know, the Afghan refugee situation and it's been on the news. It's a very sad situation. Um, and so the question is, why did California decide to take in over 5,000 Afghan refugees when California and specifically Santa Clara County has a water shortage, a housing shortage, an extremely high unemployment rate and homelessness? Would this affect global warming? And then the follow-up, which I actually think is a separate question is why ask residents to cut back on water usage then? Mm -hmm. It's 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 a it, it's an important issue, um, and and to be honest, an issue that I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, I'm I'm the grandson of of Holocaust survivors, of Holocaust refugees. Uh, my grandma and and her mom smuggled themselves out of out of the Warsaw ghetto in Poland uh, as as Hitler was coming to power, uh, and made their way. Same thing with my grandpa on my on my mom's side, and and made their way to the East Coast. Um, and, and found safety and security uh, in America. And, you know, I, I think that's a critical role that America plays in our world, um, especially in a situation where, where we got involved. Uh, now, again, this is a federal issue. This is, I should have prefaced it by saying this is a federal issue, not a state issue, um, and, and not anything necessarily that the state had to do with. But, but I, I think that inviting and welcoming and providing refuge to people who are fleeing, uh, uh, you know, persecution and and possible death uh, is something that makes America and California and the Bay Area stronger. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think that uh, you know, there's there's a slight possibility that there might be a little impact on people's lives by welcoming. I think they said five thousand. Uh, Afghan refugees uh, into California, but I think long term there's massive benefit uh, to, to being an open society that that wants to help people who are fleeing persecution. When I was a practicing lawyer, I helped a, a young man who who fled the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, get uh, asylum in the United States um, based on per, uh, political persecution back in Kinshasa in, in the capital of of the of the DRC. Uh, I my personal belief is this makes us better. Uh, and this makes us stronger. So I, I understand that people might have disagreements on that, but um, you know, I, I think it's important for us to to. It, it's on it's on the Statue of Liberty. I mean, it's who we are. We are a nation of immigrants uh, who were fleeing persecution uh, from other places, unless you're Native American, uh, in which case I apologize for invading your land. So uh, you know, I think this is something that's important for for California, and I think it's something that we should all support and embrace. Thanks for that, Assemblymember Berman. Um, well said. Um, so another topic that we know has been top of mind for many Californians um, is SB9 and also SB10, even though I think SB9 is um, talked about more. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do have a string of questions related to both bills, um, which have now been signed by the governor. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the first question to you is, you know, why did you vote 
the way you did on both SB9 and SB10? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's important issues. Um, and, and, you know, uh, Mayor Flagger, as you know, every day, uh, we have it, tens of for me, tens of thousands, for you, thousands uh, of, constitu of constituents and, and millions of Californians who struggle under the weight of the housing crisis that we have in, in, the Cal in, in California, and that's so acute in the Bay Area. And, and, you know, due to the astronomical cost of housing in my district, in the 24th Assembly District and, and throughout the state, these constituents, these Californians are forced to choose, these neighbors, these neighbors of ours, people we know, are forced to choose between paying rent and utilities or buying food or accessing the health care they need. And, and we're failing these Californians. We, we're failing these neighbors. We're failing these friends. Uh, for decades, California and especially the Bay Area has been prolific at creating jobs. Uh, but we've been negligent when it comes to building the housing necessary to accommodate so many more workers. And addressing the housing crisis will require multiple solutions. There's, there's no silver bullet. Uh, one such solution is SB 10, uh, which, uh, as the mayor knows, is a completely permissive bill that provides cities with another tool to try to build denser infill housing. And for as long as I've been in the assembly, the, the cities in my district have requested additional voluntary tools to build more housing. And that's exactly what SB 10 does, uh, which is why I, I supported it in the assembly. A another solution is SB 9 which will allow up to four units of housing to be built on a single family lot, an increase of one unit compared to existing law. That's important for people. I was talking with somebody this morning and they said, oh, I didn't realize that we could currently build three units of housing on a single family lot. You can, the house, you can build a unit in the garage and you can have a standalone ADU, accessible dwelling unit. Uh, the, the author of SB9, President Pro Tem Tony Atkins, made multiple amendments to address concerns that were raised by opponents. Uh, and these amendments include adding anti-displacement provisions to make sure renters aren't kicked out, adding a three-year homeowner occupancy requirement to make sure the bill benefits homeowners, not institutional investors, and authorizing local governments to deny a proposed housing development or lot split if the building official of the city makes a written finding that it would create a specific fire hazard that cannot be mitigated. I know that's a concern. Uh, that was a concern that, that a number of constituents raised. And when SB9 came up for a vote on the floor, I was really struck by the range of colleagues who spoke in favor uh, of the bill and the diversity of the districts they represent. They were urban, suburban, rural, Democrat and Republican, from very liberal to very conservative. Uh, these were white colleagues, Black, Latino, and API. Uh, and the one thing they all have in common is they see, and, and I see, the dire impacts that the housing crisis is having on, on our communities. Uh, and, and they refuse to continue kicking the can down the road, and, and I agree with them. So SB9 won't single-handedly solve our, our housing crisis. I actually truly believe it will have much less of an impact that a lot of people are worried about, but it will help address housing affordability by creating duplexes and smaller single family homes at more moderate price points. Uh, and, and this is in addition to the historic investments that California is making to support our local governments uh, and nonprofits to develop and build affordable housing, which is a technical term, subsidized housing uh, that the state is investing billions of dollars in over the next few years. So just to quickly wrap up, you know, for decades, we've failed. Uh, we failed to build enough housing in California, and we failed the most vulnerable among us. And, and these two housing bills attempt to right some of those wrongs uh, and, and create a framework to restore some of the socioeconomic diversity that, that my district, which I grew up in, um, and is now one of the most expensive in the country, has lost. Uh, we, we, we've lost that socioeconomic diversity that I think makes our communities better. Um, and so uh, that's a long answer, I know, uh, but, but that's, that's why I decided to vote for SB9 and SB10. No, thanks for that very candid um, response, Assemblymember Berman. You know, I will share, you know, the Los Altos City Council voted to oppose unless amended, that was our position. Um, but it wasn't lost on us the challenge that you and State Senator Becker 
were going through. I know it wasn't an easy decision. I know you both arrived at it because you thought that was the right solution based on all the data and information you just provided. Um, I know the Los Altos City Council, we approved or 330 Distal Circle, which is our first ever 100% affordable housing project. And we're still very exciting and we're still going through the community engagement process. And you know, the question asked about SB9 and SB10 is very similar to some of the issues raised by our residents related to 330 distal circle. And what we do explain is exactly what you're saying, where we do have a housing crisis. And in order for us to really diver diversify um, the types of units we have, we have to do these kinds of projects um, so that we can have, you know, that nice person at the Starbucks that serves you your coffee, being able to live in our community, um, you know, or school staff, not necessarily teachers, but there are many other staff members at our schools who help to make it work. And we could go down the list of mm -hmm. individuals that serve and help us every day. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, because they've been priced out of our community, they're commuting hours per day, not spending time with their kids, mm -hmm. their families. Um, they're just basically going in and going out. And we wouldn't want that for ourselves. And so I just, I agree with you, finding ways to build more affordable housing in our communities at all levels of income should be a priority and our value system here in Santa Clara County. And I believe it is. Um, so I will actually, Assemblymember Berman, go through the list of questions because you know they all relate to SB9 and SB10. Sure. And I think you've already touched on some of these questions, but I wouldn't want someone listening in to think, oh, my question didn't get asked. Sure. So I'm going to go through all the SB9, SB10 questions that were submitted. And if I ask a question that you don't feel as if you have addressed yet, then obviously you can, you can respond. So let me go through the other SB9, SB10 questions. How do you expect the cities to enforce the intent to occupy provision in SB9 and why the requirement that you have occupancy? I think that's what they're re referring to. And why didn't you simply demand three years of occupancy? Mm -hmm. Do you expect SB9 and SB10 to result in lots of demolitions, to result in you know, lots being demolished and then people rebuilding duplexes? How does SB 9 and 10 deal with possible overcrowding of streets with cars? How do you expect the tax base in Los Altos to afford the extra cost for services that SB 9 and SB 10 will generate? How do you justify the inevitable degradation in quality of life, more people competing for the same services while not contributing fairly via property tax for the services they consume. Not to mention the increased traffic congestion, demand for parking, crowded shopping that will result. And then the last question comment under the SB9, SB10 section is, thank you for voting for SB9 and SB10. What can we expect now that SB 9 and 10 have passed? What more will the state do to increase affordable and entry level housing? Yeah, great, great questions and, and definitely covered a lot. And let me see if I can try to, you know, quickly hit some answers. But first of all, you know, I, I just I, I couldn't have agreed more with everything that you said um, in regards to the impact. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. But but the real impact of the affordability crisis uh, has on our communities and, and I and I would argue has on our quality of life. Um, so one of the questions had to do with the intent to occupy provision uh, in SB9 and, and the author. And let me just say, I know people get frustrated when I don't take a position on bills really early on in the process. But the reason I don't do that is because the bills change a lot. Um, and, and this is one example where the bill changed very late in the process, but before, you know, right before I voted on it. And that amendments that the authors of bills take impact my decision on whether or not to support or oppose the bills. So in this instance, uh, the author, uh, Senator Atkins, President Pro Tem Atkins, took amendments that require a local agency to impose a three-year owner occupancy requirement as a condition of a homeowner receiving a, a ministerial lot split. 
uh, the ability to split their lot. And to, to enforce the provision, applicants are required to sign an affidavit, which means that a person is agreeing to this condition. And here, this is where it's important, under penalty of perjury. And I know that some people may read the bill and they don't see a specific penalty delineated for failure to follow the ownership occupancy provision, but the penalty in existing law for perjury is a felony. Um, so so I, I think that's a pretty serious penalty uh, for people who are signing an affidavit under penalty of perjury and expect that applicants take very seriously the risk of, of a felony prosecution if, if they uh, are found to be cheating the system. Um, in regards to, and I'll kind of just lump this into, um, you know, you covered a lot of it, to be honest, this issue of demolitions, uh, the impact on our quality of life, and that kind of, you know, are, is it going to be increased traffic? There's increased traffic in our communities already because people who live hours away, just like you said, our teachers, our school staff, our baristas, our people who work at restaurants, our chefs, our kitchen staff, are driving in from Gilroy and Tracy and Modesto and further, creating traffic in our communities and coming into our communities and creating the massive greenhouse gas emissions that I know the vast majority of Los Altans care about, concern about climate change, because these people aren't driving Teslas. They're driving, you know, gas combustion vehicles. Um, and, and, you know, that is creating a ton of the traffic and parking problems on our streets. This concern around tax base, you know, the, the, the building new housing at, you know, and then having that housing assessed at existing valuations will improve our tax base. The problem with our tax base is, is Prop 13. And the fact that, you know, there are people who inherited their parents' house back in the 80s and are still living in, our, in those homes in our communities, paying property tax based on the valuation from when somebody's parents bought the house in the 50s or 60s. That, you know, and, and they're the ones who are still driving and using roads and, and all these things and not contributing to the tax base. So if somebody were to tear down their home and build a new one or, or sell it, then all of a sudden that property tax valuation increases to present day value and our cities get the tax base they need. So I think this is actually helpful in terms of increasing our, our property tax base in our communities. Now, and you know, you touched upon it. I was going to touch upon it more um, and I'll try not to, but just our communities, our quality of life is worse when restaurants shut down because they can't afford to pay, uh, uh, you know, their, their staff enough to be able to live anywhere near here. Or I read an article the other day about how teachers who can't afford to buy homes in, Cal in, in, in the Bay Area are moving to other parts of the state and other parts of the country. And we are losing good teachers, which I saw when I was growing up in Palo Alto in the 80s um, and, and 90s. And it's even worse now. You know, and, and our school age population, I haven't looked at Los Altos. I know Palo Alto, where I grew up, the school age population is plummeting. And, and that means that communities are having to decide which schools to close. Uh, and that has a massive impact on our communities when all of a sudden your neighborhood school closes down um, and, and your kids have to bike or be driven even further, which creates traffic and some of those problems. So, you know, I, I think um, uh, quality of life is a very big issue um, that encompasses a lot more than whether or not you have to wait at a stop sign for an extra 15 to 30 seconds. Um, and I really encourage everybody to look at it um, from a more macro perspective, I think. Um, lastly, quickly, that last question about what are we going to do more? Let me just touch upon some things in the state budget this year that provide significant investment in developing, constructing, and preserving affordable and livable housing. This includes $1.75 billion with a B to alleviate the backlog in affordable, in affordable housing construction, $300 million for the preservation of existing affordable housing, $500 million for the creation of a foreclosure intervention housing preservation program, $600 million for planning and implementation grants to help local governments. Uh, and let me know, uh, Mayor, if, if you all have any questions about how to apply for these funds, but $600 million for planning and implementation for local governments to plan for and meet their goals under the sustainable uh, community strategies. Um, and then roughly $12 billion in new funding for homelessness programs over the next two years, a uh, billion dollars in support for local governments to address homelessness for both 2021-22 and for 22-23. Um, more than $4 billion over two years for various programs operated out of the Department of Social Services, giving the wraparound services that a lot of people need. Um, so, you know, I know we've got a lot of questions, so I'll stop there. But, you know, we are... We are 
spending a significant amount of money right now. We're, we're lucky that our economy stayed strong, that we have a bigger budget surplus than we anticipated. And we're trying to funnel that money back into affordable housing and, and helping our homeless population get off the street and, and stay off the street. Thank you, Assemblymember Berman. And I will also mention, I serve on the ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments on the executive board. And we are also as an organization um, making funding available to support local jurisdictions and cities um, as we go through the next year and a half to update our housing element to figure out where we're going to place um, these units that have been allocated to our city. And so, you know, the regional board the state at your level are really looking at ways to support local jurisdictions financially because they recognize part of the challenge is financial. Mm -hmm. so thanks for that. Absolutely. All right. Do you want, so there's a question here for me on Fremont Avenue. Take it. Let's do it. Okay. I can quickly answer that one because I have good news um, for the person who asked the question. So the question is the Fremont Avenue stretch from 85 to Rancho that merges into Foothill is terrible. Um, the Patrick sections are the worst they've ever seen and they've turned into potholes. There's gravel everywhere. What is the city doing to fix these potholes? Um, and I remember talking to Zach on your staff before we got started saying, you know, this is actually one of the top things local government works on, right? Because it impacts our residents every day when they're commuting to work or play. Um, and so starting next month, the city will start its resurf resurfacing project on Fremont Avenue. So this is already in the schedule it's, and it's, it's scheduled to launch next month. So very timely question. That's 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 awesome, and I, it's this is actually how I got my start uh, in local government. It was I was appointed to an infrastructure blue ribbon commission in the city of Palo Alto before I got elected to anything. Um, so you're absolutely right, and it's complicated. You want to time things up so that you fix the street once. You don't kind of fix it right before they're you know digging into it again for a sewer project or whatever. But that's great to hear that this constituent will be. Uh, happy with with the the improvements to Fremont Ave, and the state is trying to give as much money as possible. Um, one of my first big bills I, I voted for was this bill SB one back in 2017 that creates 54 billion dollars uh, over the next decade to fix roads, freeways, bridges, and transit. And I believe half of that money was going to local county and local government, um, and then half for state. So um, I guess approximately 312 million in SB one dollars. Um, are funding 16 local and regional projects benefiting Los Altos. Uh, and I won't get into what all those projects are, but um, you know, hopefully we can get our pavement condition index. I'm one of the weird people who is passionate about pavement condition index. Uh, PCI is a priority for Los Altos as well. I like it. I like it. Oh, it could always be higher. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, much, it was much higher than it is today. <laughs> and we'll try to get back to that high number. We, um, we, good. Good. So someone mentioned um, in the chat asked, you know, why we weren't um, publishing the chat comments or questions. And I do want to touch on that because even for city council meetings, we don't do that um, because it can be distracting um, where people, you know, start having conversations or start raising other topics that can be very distracting for the panelists and also for the members of the public who would be seeing that ch that the chat stream and then you know being focused on that instead of the discussion but as we said you know this is being recorded the questions and answers will be part of the recording obviously um, but that is the main reason why we do not have the chat feature um, active but we encourage folks to enter any questions they may have that I, that they haven't submitted yet in the Q&A feature correct well, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. It's it's kind of funny. I mean, it's it's as if, you know, back when we'd have in-person meetings that it, it, and then as if everybody in the audience could just be throwing questions in the middle of our conversation, you know, it's just not it's not how 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 uh, a good conversation goes. So I appreciate everything you just said. No, thanks, Assemblymember Berman and to your staff. Um, next topic has to do with accepting um, donations from developers. Um, so how much money did you take from developers and hedge, hedge funds to vote for SB9 and SB10? 
And I'll do the follow up. How will you protect local control over zoning from developers pouring money to influence the, le the legislation? Yeah, I, I took zero money from developers and hedge funds to vote for any bill. I don't take any money from anybody uh, to vote for any bill. To quickly touch on, upon hedge funds, uh, I, I've, I don't think I've ever received a dollar from a hedge fund. I, most of them are legally uh, prohibited from giving because a lot of them invest in pensions uh, and, and pension funds. Um, and, and that makes it illegal for them to then give to, to political campaigns. Um, but, you, you know, it, it's the same thing. I represent Silicon Valley. And, and so I get a lot of contributions from tech companies. And then I run bills that tech companies hate, uh, like my bill to make it easier for you, for a consumer to cancel your service. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't factor in any of the contributions that I receive into the votes that I take uh, on bills. And, and you know, I'm very confident that my track record shows that. Um, and, and it's, I find that people who claim corruption uh, when they don't like the way that an elected official votes are similar to the people who, who claim that there's voting fraud when they don't like the results of an election. Um, and, and, you know, there's no evidence of it. If there is, it would be prosecuted um, and, and people would be held to account. Um, so, you know, that's, that's not something that, that I do. Um, and, and that's not something that goes into any consideration that I make when I'm deciding how to vote. On a bill, um, in, in regards to local control over zoning, um, you know SB nine. So SB ten, as I mentioned earlier, is is complete local control. It's up to local governments to voluntarily avail themselves of the ability to to increase infill development if they want to. So it's it's a complete local control bill. SB nine, uh, homeowners must comply with local zoning requirements such as height, floor area ratios, lot coverage if they wanna develop a duplex. Um, and additionally, under the bill, a local agency may impose objective zoning standards, objective subdivision standards, and objective design review standards, as long as they don't physically prevent a lot split or a duplex if other criteria are met. So it, it tries to find a balance. Um, I know a lot of people hold local control sacrosanct. Um, I'm, I'm not one of them. Uh, I think that there are certain issues that communities face uh, that that rise above this issue of local control, but but when the state is impinging upon local control, I think it's it's good to do it as as um, delicately as possible. Uh, and, and I think SB nine attempted to do that. I know it didn't satisfy everybody, and and that's just the situation and, and the reality. But uh, I know that uh, you know good attempts were made to still provide for local control while also making it uh, easier for people to build more housing. Thank you. There's so many, you know, hot topics right now in California. You know, we just got done with the recall election. Um, I know I saw you a couple of times out there. Um, and a question also came in, I think, through the Q&A on the recall. So I, I, you know, I'll do the two questions that were pre-submitted, but if you could really talk about the process, because of course, a lot of people now are questioning, you know, what is this recall process? There are some Californians who weren't here for the Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, recall. And so this is all new to them. Um, so the two questions pre-submitted are, what is the timeline for possibly reforming the recall process? What are the options you, or maybe the state, um, is considering to make the recall process more democratic? How will you fix the inequity of the local reform process, specifically the absurd low threshold and the high price tag that communities have to foot for a recall election? Yeah, all great questions. And I'll be as quick as possible because I could talk for an hour. Um, so we, uh, as chair of the elections committee, I'm convening uh, informational hearings across, well, we don't know if they'll all be virtual or maybe some of them might be uh, in Southern California with my colleague in the Senate, uh, Steve Glazer, to review and evaluate and discuss all the different ideas around amending the recall process in California. And one of the biggest concerns that I have about the recall process, two big concerns. One, it's too easy to qualify a recall in California. Uh, California in California, it takes 12%, you have to collect signatures uh, equal to 12% of the prior gubernatorial election. 
Um, and 12 per, only 19 states in the country have a recall process for a governor. And of those 19, 12% is the lowest. We're an outlier in terms of, of how easy it is to qualify a recall. Kansas, for example, has 40%, um, which is probably too high. Uh, so we're going to discuss uh, you know, what, what might the different impacts be of increasing that percentage to qualify the recall uh, from 12% to, to higher, 16, 20, 25. These are things we're going to discuss. And then a huge problem that I have with the recall is that it's undemocratic. Uh, in this past recall, Governor Newsom could have been recalled and then replaced by somebody else who received less votes than Governor Newsom received. Uh, and that's not a democracy when somebody, when an elected official is replaced by somebody who got less votes than they did. Uh, and, and so that is an issue that uh, is also kind of unique to California because we have this two question part process where the first question is, do you want to recall the governor? Yes or no. And then the second question is, who would you support if the governor gets recalled? And the governor cannot by constitution be on that qu second question currently. Um, and so we're going to be looking at multiple different ideas. I've had colleagues raise the idea that if the governor gets recalled, the lieutenant governor should become governor. Interestingly, the lieutenant governor, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, just last week came out opposed to that idea, worried about the, the tension it would create between the governor and lieutenant governor. There are also issues about whether or not we should have a first have the recall question and then later on have an election to replace. Lots of different ideas. But it's important that we evaluate these different ideas and, and see what might fit for California, that we do some polling uh, of Cal some scientific polling of California residents to find out what might have support. Because at the end of the day, the substantive changes are going to amend the Constitution and, and go to voters. On the local recall issue, this is a huge issue as well and an issue that we're going to be discussing probably in our second hearing, which will be at some point in early December, uh, is what we're looking at. Excuse me. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, we want to we want to get a better understanding of of you know, all the different levels of government in California, the different recall processes that apply to the different levels of government, and then how those processes can be changed, because some of them, uh, we're, we're still figuring out, I have a call with a, a constitutional law professor this afternoon to get a better understanding of whether or not those changes need to be made to the California Constitution. Can they be made through state legislation, through a bill, or can they just be made at the local level? Um, depending on charter cities or non-charter cities, can they can they choose or, or different uh, you know educational agencies can they make those changes themselves? So these are all things that we're going to be looking at because we wasted three hundred million dollars, upwards of three hundred million dollars on this recall process, and all the recall did was affirm what voters said in two thousand eighteen and what voters were going to have the opportunity to say in two thousand twenty two. Um, and and so I think we need to create a system that's more democratic and less subject to abuse by a small percentage of people um, who are mad about policies that elected officials enacted, as opposed to something like a crime uh, or ethical malfeasance or something like that. No, and I'll quickly share, you know, my 13 year old son even looked at this process process and said it didn't make sense. <laughs> my husband and I explained, you know, what the recall was and how it worked and talked about the ballot. And one of the questions he asked was, you know, shouldn't Governor Newsom also be on that second question, you know? Um, and sure. so, yeah, so, you know, I, I definitely support, um, you know, revisiting and, and reviewing the current process. Um, it's broken in different ways and obviously subject to abuse. Mm. So I'm going to go to, I know we're, you know, we have 10 minutes left. I quickly want to go to plastic packaging. I think there's a question for me and a question for you and you've been talking. So I am happy to answer the first one and then I'll come to you. Perfect. Um, so why doesn't Los Altos have a moratorium on plastic bags? Can Los Altos encourage retailers to advocate for less plastic packaging from their suppliers? Um, so Los Altos currently has a plastic bag ban um, back in March 2013. The council at the time adopted a reusable bag ordinance prohibiting the distribution of single use carry out bags and requiring a minimum charge for the distribution of reusable or recyclable bags. Prior to COVID, the council, and I was on that council, it was after I was elected, was also considering a single use plastic ban on foodware. Mm -hmm. But then COVID happened. 
And as everybody knows, and we've talked about, you know, the challenges that the business community and the restaurants have gone through during COVID and the increased demand for takeout where they needed to use more unfortunate plastic containers in order to meet the demands. And so we decided as a council to put that on hold. So the single use plastic ban on food were on hold. It's still on our list of things that as a council is a priority. But that's where we are in Los Altos when it comes to plastic packaging. Um, but we completely understand why this is a concern. Um, and I think we are aligned, the council is aligned with that constituent's concern. Um, and, and I expect that we will revisit that food we're ban um, in the near future. I, I, your question, your question, Assemblymember Berman, are you doing anything to help limit the use of plastic packaging at the state level? Yeah, it's, it's and first let me just say thank you to you and your colleagues for, for um, trying to jump out ahead of state law and go above and beyond state law, uh, to, because that helps prove the concept of some of these new restrictions on, on plastic uh, products that you can then come to me and say, hey, it worked in Los Altos, and I can then introduce state legislation to say, hey, it worked in these different diverse communities across the state, let's do this statewide. And that's what happened with the, the plastic bag ban, uh, where it was first adopted by a lot of local uh, municipalities, and then we do now, we still have a ban on single use carry out plastic bags from retailers that still exists. I know it's not always followed uh, based on different establishments that, that, that I get you know, uh, goods or food from. During the height of COVID, uh, you know, one of the governor's executive orders temporarily waived the ban, but that executive order has expired. Uh, so the ban is back in effect. Um, it, We've had a lot of bills in this space, um, and, and I've voted for every single one of them. I've also introduced a couple in prior years. But just to quickly touch upon bills this year, um, the single biggest plastics-related bill this year was by my, my, my old friend from before either of us were elected to anything, Senator Ben Allen, uh, who represents uh, uh, Southern California, kind of Santa Monica, Malibu area. His bill, SB 343, prohibits starting in 2024 using the, the chasing arrows symbol that's meant to uh, show that something's recyclable, it limits that on packaging unless the packaging is actually recyclable and recycled in California. Uh, because these arrows and labors, labels are often misleading and many items with the chasing arrows symbol are not recyclable or are not recycled. And not only is this providing consumers inaccurate information, it also drives up the cost of waste services and can contaminate the recycling stream. Uh, and this bill was passed by the legislature and is uh, awaiting action by the governor. Another bill that I supported uh, is AB 881 uh, by my colleague Lorena Gonzalez in the assembly. This bill is pretty technical, but it would essentially prohibit a local jurisdiction from claiming waste diversion or recycling credit for exporting mixed or contaminated plastics where much of those plastics end up in landfills or are burned. And I know there's been a lot, we've, we've gotten to understand the recycling system across the world a lot better over the last couple of years and how we might think that we're recycling something, but in reality, it's ending up in Southeast Asia in a landfill or being burned even worse, uh, which, is, which is awful. Uh, I also hope the governor will sign AB 1276 by my colleague, Wendy Carrillo, uh, which would prohibit restaurants from providing single use utensils unless the consumer asks for them. I don't know about you, but I get too much takeout uh, and I end up with a drawer full of these single use, non-recyclable, non-compostable forks and knives that I never use. And then I end up having to throw away when my wife yells at me uh, for the lack of drawer space. And, and so um, that's another good bill. Uh, and then there's, there's another bill uh, that I won't get into the details because I know we're running out of time, but the bottom line is, these bills struggle too much in the legislature. I have, you know, even though we have a super majority of Democrats in the Assembly and in the Senate, too many good environmental bills die. Um, and, and it's a huge problem. It's a big concern that I have um, and, and, and something that, that I'm going to keep on trying to, you know, explain to my colleagues why these policies are so important and, and how we're, we're really negatively impacting future generations by the decisions we made today or, or decades ago. Um, so it's unfortunate. I know it's frustrating for a lot of constituents, um, but, but I know, you know me and, and a good group of colleagues are going to continue working on, on these, these policies. 
So much to talk about Assemblymember Berman. And on the chasing arrows, we know so many of our kids look for that recycle symbol to determine, you know, does it go in the green bin or the blue bin or the trash? Yeah. So, you know, that's, I, I, I'm going to share that. You know, you can't just automatically assume because everybody looks for that chasing arrow symbol that it really means recycle. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so we have two more pre-submitted questions. I do want to get to those before we end. Um, so quickly on vaccinations, do you believe that mandated vaccine passports or medical discrimination? And it's the whole idea of constitutional rights during the pandemic and things that as a government we needed to do. Yeah, it's it's it, uh, it's an important issue. It's a very complicated issue. You know, it's important to remember that California law mandates vaccines, mandates immunizations for already a, almost a dozen different things, Dip, diphtheria, measles, mumps, uh, rubella, uh, polio, tetanus, hepatitis B, chicken pox. Um, and, and it's more than just this issue of COVID and this issue of vaccines is so much more than personal choice uh, because the choice that you make can literally kill somebody else. Uh, that's the reality of this vaccine without that person even knowing that you were a danger or a threat to them. It's not like you come in with a with a machine gun and it's easy to tell that, that oh I should stay away from you you're dangerous. You know this vaccine this 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 pan this this virus uh, kills people without them having any idea you know where it came from and and so uh, you know it, it's 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 a much more complicated issue I think than than just personal choice. Um, and, and I think that I have a personal choice to be able to to go out into the community um, in a way that that doesn't risk my life. Um, and, and so I think that's the balance that a lot of, uh, you know, different levels of government agencies are trying to figure out in deciding, you know, how, how you know, whether or not vaccines should be mandated and in, and in what situations do you need to be vaccinated, show proof of vaccination um, or wear a mask or, or whatever the situation is. I think you're, yep. I was. Um, last pre-submitted question. Are there any informational resources to help us move from grass lawns to more natural landscaping? And I can quickly, because I this was asked before, and I know the Cal Water website has some resources there on water efficient landscaping, and we're encouraging um, residents to do those things as well here. And I don't know if you have anything to add, any state resources to point them to. Just Valley Water, which is the water agency for Los Altos, also has great resources uh, on how we can save water during the drought and, and different kind of incentive programs to do different things. So definitely visit their, their website. They offer sustainable landscape guidelines and design templates. I did a drought town hall a couple of months ago. Uh, I think all that information is up on my website also um, and happy to provide more information to folks uh, if they want to reach out to us. Thank you. And Assemblymember Berman, before I give very brief closing remarks, I wanted to see if there was any other question or anything I missed you wanted to quickly address before we close. No, no. I, you know, I want to respect people's time. I know we said we we're going to keep this to an hour, um, but really appreciate a lot of the questions. And, and um, you know, I, I hope we were able to provide some answers for folks. I know a lot of folks might not like the answers that they heard, um, but, but hopefully at least they appreciate the you know, the information that we gave and, and some of the explanations for why I make some of the decisions that I make. Right. And next time we'll do this for hour and a half. An hour is just not <laughs> deal. Fun. Happily. And I do want to thank everybody who showed up, who called in. I know it's in the middle of the day. Really appreciate it. Appreciate the questions. Um, and Assembly Member Berman and to your staff, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thanks for answering the questions that you could. Um, and, you know, if possible, if you could share with the people listening in, you know, if they have any follow-up questions, you know, what email address should they send those questions to? I think the residents would really appreciate that. Visit my website. So Google, because I don't have the, the URL off the top of my head, but Google Mark Berman, comma, assembly member. Go to my official website. There's an easy link to, uh, to be able to submit comments or questions. If you submit it that way, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. It, it can take some time, um, but we try to write back to, to every person who submits a question through through the website that's by far the best way to do it thank you mayor flagger for all you do uh for los altos uh and for joining me for today's conversation uh really appreciate it and look forward to more chats in the future for 90 minutes instead of six minutes, minutes. <laughs> okay that was the last word <laughs> thanks everybody appreciate it oh, thank you bye-bye